Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you to the more than 52,000 people who were tested till 8 p.m. last night. That is a very good result. And obviously, given the situation we're under, it's really important for anybody with the mildest of symptoms to come forward and get tested. Anyone who's been deemed, of course, a close or casual contact must get tested. And of course, even if you're a casual contact, you have to stay isolated until you get advice to the contrary. Uh, I want to thank everybody for accepting the government's decision yesterday in relation to the two week lockdown. Uh, the anecdotal evidence we have to date, and Deputy Commissioner Warboys will comment on this, is that people are being compliant and we're deeply grateful for that. I'm absolutely convinced that if all of us pull together, we will start seeing the results uh, we want to achieve over the next two weeks. Uh, yesterday to 8 p.m. we had 30 cases of community transmission. 11 of those were already in isolation, which is positive. The balance of those cases are all linked, which is another positive. However, uh, which is one of the reasons uh, we're in the situation we are, a number of those cases, even though they were linked, um, Health understands that a number of people were in the community whilst potentially infectious and Dr Chant will go through all that and that's why you might see additional venues pop up and we do ask everybody to keep monitoring the newsouthwales.gov.au website or else the New South Wales Health website for those latest information on venues and to respond accordingly. Of course, the stay at home provisions still mean we encourage everybody to come forward and get the medical attention they need. We encourage everybody to come forward and get the vaccine. And of course, uh, we want to make sure uh, that people have that information about testing and about their own status and the status of their close uh, loved ones uh, to make sure all of us stay safe. Uh, Dr Chant will of course go through all those cases and, uh, and make sure that all of us are aware of what's going on in the next little while. Can I also stress that whilst you're outdoor exercising, we've said that you're outdoors, sorry I should say outdoor walking or exercising, whilst you're outdoors in groups of up to 10, you don't have to wear a mask whilst you're exercising, so I just want to make that clear. Uh, clearly. Uh, if you're having to go to work and have no other option or you're clearly uh, having to, uh, to go outside of, um, uh, outside of your home into an indoor setting, you need to wear a mask. But if you are outdoors um, exercising in up to groups of 10, so long as you maintain good social distancing, there's no need to wear a mask. So I just wanted to make that clear to everybody. Uh, again, my deepest gratitude to everybody for adhering to the rules. Um, Service New South Wales receives um, thousands of calls yesterday and we're grateful that people are so interested in looking up the information. We encourage that conti to continue. 
And I do also want to foreshadow that the New South Wales Government is working on a package to provide support to businesses and that will be announced uh, in the next few days and will be uh, ensuring that Service New South Wales is available for that to occur. Can I also encourage everybody to use QR codes whenever you have physical contact, even if it's with good social distancing and even if it's with a mask, uh, please register your QR contact. We know QR code, we know a lot of businesses have gone from you know sitting in to, to take away. If you're going to physically pick up anything, please make sure you register. It just allows our contact tracers that extra bit of time we save uh, when we know who's been where at what time. It makes their job so much easier. Uh, I also do want to foreshadow that given how contagious this strain of the virus is, we do anticipate that in the next few days, case numbers are likely to increase even beyond what we've seen today because we are seeing that people in isolation, unfortunately, will have already transmitted it to all of their household contacts. So uh, we do want to anticipate that case numbers will increase, but the measure of our success won't be so much the people in isolation who get the disease, but the measure of our success will be to limit the number of people who've been out and about in the community who get the disease. And that's why we are in the situation we are. We need to prevent people who may be infectious from circulating the disease in the community. And that's why it's really, really important for all of us to respect the stay at home or lockdown provisions so all of us can stay safe. I also wanted to thank many in our regional communities who for the first time will have had restrictions imposed on them in a way they haven't had them imposed before. And I just want to thank all of our regional communities in particular as well for taking the health advice and limiting their activities so that we can keep everybody safe across the state. I now ask Dr Chant to give an update on the 30 cases of community transmission as well as venues of concern and then Deputy Commissioner Warboys will make some comments around compliance and what police are doing to make sure everybody obeys the rules. Unfortunately, we know that it only takes a few people not to do the right thing for the virus uh, to continue to spread in ways in which uh, we cannot have it do. Uh, and then after that, we'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Premier. So New South Wales recorded 30 locally acquired cases of COVID in the 24 hours to 8pm last night. All of these cases are linked to the Bondi cluster. 11 of the cases were in isolation throughout their infectious period and a further three cases were in isolation for part of their infectious period. As the Premier has indicated, what we're hoping is over coming days that we announce cases that have been in, is in isolation for their full infectious period and therefore there has been no one else in the community potentially exposed. Uh, two cases were overseas acquired in the 24 hours uh, to 8 p.m. last night, bringing the total number of cases in New South Wales to 5,567. There were 52,048 tests and can I thank the community. Uh, we haven't tallied the numbers, but we suspect this run of testing to surpass even that of the Northern Beaches in response to the Avalon cluster. Um, don't hold me to that till we do those numbers, but certainly it's been a massive response to the community. We knew, do need to maintain those incredibly high testing rates um, as we flush up any unrecognised um, cases. We have got um, one person in um, ICU, but they are not ventilated. And uh, the majority of our COVID cases, which is 79 that we're in New South Wales Health is currently caring for, the majority of those are in uh, the special health accommodation or being treated in out of hospital care. In terms of updates about significant um, clusters or, or, or trains of transmission, we have 10 new cases are linked to the Great Ocean Foods Seafood Wholesaler in Marrickville. And this brings the total number of cases acquired through the Great Ocean Foods to 11, not including the original source case who work there whilst infectious. So can I reiterate my comments from yesterday where I asked that any person and their household con contacts who attended or directly received a delivery from Great Ocean Foods from Monday the 21st of June to Friday the 21st of June must immediately call New South Wales Health on 1800 943 553 get tested and isolate until New South Wales Health provides further advice. And given those potential exposure periods date back a number of days, I am asking for the whole household 
of those individuals to isolate and also get tested and ring that call number to get advice. We've had some additional cases associated with the West Hoxton birthday party. And again, um, this is to be expected. Uh, there's two factors here that cases may well have transmitted to their households. And so we see a long tail of cases linked to this. Again, our index will be whether all of those cases are contained and not, have not added any new days of exposure, infection to the infectious days, exposure days. Um, there are one of the cases that were linked um, to the Great Ocean Foods um, outbreak has, uh, was a um, flight crew and we've been working closely with uh, Virgin Australia and our colleagues in Victoria and Queensland overnight. The, the, uh, a public health alert was sent out last night but there were a number of Virgin flights. Um, flight number VA939, Friday 25th of June. The departure, departure location was Sydney at 11.51 and it arrived in Brisbane at 1.25 p.m. On Friday the 25th of June, a Virgin VA334 that departed Brisbane at 2.59 p.m. and arrived in Melbourne at 5.16 p.m. Virgin 827 departed on Saturday the 26th of Melbourne at 9 o'clock and arrived in Sydney at 11.14. And VA 517 that departed on Saturday the 26th of June and arrived in Sydney at 11.14 a.m. Sorry, departed Sydney at 11.14 a.m. and arrived at the Gold Coast on 12.40 p.m. And then VA524 that travelled on the 26th of June from Gold Coast at 1.26pm to Sydney at 2.47pm. We had um, texted from the manifest people that had been on those flights, but in case there were any um, protocols, uh, text messages that didn't get received, I'm alerting everyone in the, pop, in the community to be vigilant and to check the website for those flights and we ask you to immediately isolate and get tested. Um, I can report that the sewage in Burke, um, previous retests have indicated that that is, um, that we've detected no new fragments of the virus, uh, so that's pleasing. Those, sa those samples were collected um, on two occasions on Friday and they revealed no fragments of the virus. In relation to our sewage surveillance, um, import Kembla, we have got a positive um, detection in the sewage. We are unaware of any absolute cases in that catchment area, but we are aware that there are some contacts of the cases. So we are reaching out to those individuals and arranging retesting of those individuals just to check that they have not um, they are close contacts and have been isolating, so would not pose any risk. But as a precaution, we're warning the population there. The Port Kembla sewage network, which serves about 49,000 people living in the suburbs, including Windang, Lake Heights, Cringilla, Warrawong, Coonawarra, Brownsville, Dapto, Berkeley, Canahooka, Horsley, Avalon, Cleveland, Unandera, Kembla Grange, Primby and Port Kembla. So we're asking people in that community to be alert um, for symptoms. In relation to other cases, I can indicate that um, we did have a case that attended the vaccine centre at Westmead Hospital. Um, the day that they attended was the 22nd. At that time, they were unaware that they were uh, positive and they ter subsequently turned out to be a close contact and they were tested um, a few days later. As a precaution, we do, we, we're very conservative. Um, we have called an, the people that attended that uh, vaccine centre in a period before and after the case, and also looked at um, healthcare staff that may have been close contacts. Can I just assure people that all the staff were wearing masks and uh, the clinics got deep cleaned. Um, there's social distancing at the clinic and it's also got external external entrances, so the case did not walk through any other parts of the Westmead facility. So I continue to encourage people to come forth 
with vaccination, it is critical that we um, continue to um, get vaccinated. The other um, case I want to alert you to is a case that um, is related to the case that was not notified in um, Northern Territory. So you might recall that there was um, discussed uh, a positive case related to the granite gold mine in the Tanami Desert in Northern Territory. Um, that person, so this ca case is, can I just be clear, is not linked to our cluster. This is a new exposure that has um, related to, um, linked back to Queensland. Uh, so this person is believed to have been exposed in um, Queensland. Um, that person then travelled to the mine. That case was notified, announced yesterday. The close contacts, um, we are following up the close contacts um, and we were advised of people that were potentially in New South Wales. Um, a said close contact um, underwent testing and was positive. So that person is in the Hunter, New England local government area. I can assure the community of the Hunter, New England local government area that this case um, it was not infectious in the community, did not um, present any risk to the community of New South Wales. Um, the case um, is currently isolating in Hunter, New England and poses no risk to the community. However, we are asking anyone, whilst we are following up through multiple ways, um, we are just also putting a call out that anyone who worked at the mine in the Northern Territory between the 18th and the 26th of June and return to New South Wales should immediately isolate and call their local public health unit on 1300 066 055 to arrange urgent testing. But please immediately isolate. And obviously if you've got any symptoms, we also ask that your household um, isolate until you've got a negative um, test. So I might leave it there, um, but thank you. Good morning, uh, Premier, Dr Chant, Minister. Uh, it's pleasing to report that right across New South Wales, the vast majority of people have complied uh, with the public health orders. Uh, but unfortunately, overnight, there were still 15 uh, penalty infringement notices issued for a range of uh, incidents that occurred. Uh, some of those, uh, the variety is, is, is quite extensive when you look at, uh, at Woolworths at Kellyville, uh, a number of people uh, converging on that place, uh, trying to use the QR code and move around that store. Uh, the management there at Woolworths were, were very um, diligent in terms of uh, moving more staff to the front to try and control that. Police were called and it was a pleasing result. And I think uh, people need to really take heed that the department stores and indeed the supermarkets are trying their very best and they need people to abide by the 1.5, they need people to put their masks on and they need people to be patient and of course when we look at some of this panic buying again we just all shake our heads, it's simply not required, uh, people should not do that, it is only going to cause angst in the community and we would really ask that people just be sensible in that regard from here on in. What else uh, uh, we found over the last 24 hours was a, a, a family travelled from the eastern suburbs to a sporting event uh, up in the Hunter Valley. Uh, it was against the public health order. No matter how people think that they have to attend some of these events with their children or need to go on holidays, the public health orders are quite clear. This family were issued infringement notices and that will happen uh, to any family that's travelled outside. Uh, uh, the, the, the metropolitan area and against the public health orders. Traffic and Highway Patrol Police, our police districts and police area commands uh, are abundantly aware of where people gather uh, at these times of year leading up to school holidays and they'll be using uh, the, the mobile technology to, to run checks on people, uh, their vehicles uh, and see uh, where inquiries need to be made in those caravan parks and those places where, where people congregate uh, at this time of year. What is also noticeable over the last 24 hours is people in those communities uh, are quite uh, willing to dob in those people that have turned up uh, when they shouldn't have. So that Crime Stoppers number 1800 333 000 has already been used to alert police to make inquiries in relation to people who shouldn't be in their communities. 
The other uh, point that I would like to, uh, to also put across is that we need to show, again, some decency and respect for those people that are trying to help police and others uh, make sure that people comply with public health orders, whether that's people on train stations employed by transport at bus terminals, whether it's those people I referred to uh, at Woolworths that are trying to do the right thing. Uh, we really need to respect that everyone uh, is in this together. It's a shared responsibility uh, and we just need to, uh, to remain decent uh, and, and, and right to those people that are trying to protect uh, in New South Wales at this difficult time. The other incident that I would highlight is a cafe down in the Illawarra uh, where police were called uh, to that cafe and there was an absolute clear resistance of the cafe owner uh, and those people at front of house to actually wear a mask. It is clearly irresponsible. The community, when you look at social media, were certainly um, against that stance taken by the cafe. Uh, and in fact, police uh, had to issue infringement notices uh, and we'll follow that up in the coming days to make sure that they comply. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, could I ask how many people uh, were on the flights uh, that the Virgin crew may have uh, exposed and was that Virgin crew vaccinated? Uh, this is the... Um, I'm not aware, I haven't been advised of the, the status of the um, flight crew, but it, it is, a, just to be clear, these are domestic, domestic flights. Um, I can follow up with the general um, numbers. Obviously, um, given the restrictions various states have had in place, they may not have been full flights, but we can give you that information. We did text them, so we've worked closely with the Commonwealth, the two jurisdictions, and Virgin who were able to provide the manifests and they were texted last night. So also please, at this time, I do ask people that continue to check your phones. Um, that's the quickest way we can get to you. Uh, so please do that, that. We will be ringing and contacting everyone and working with our interstate um, colleagues. The two okay. cases that are under investigation, is that still the nine-year-old student? Um, what's the second case that's under investigation, if that's the case? And have they been genomically linked to the Bondi cluster or do they have a different strain? Look, we, we believe that that individual um, was in, a, in an area where there were um, cases um, and um, what we what we haven't found is the exact um, contact point or the exact linkage. But geographically, they were in an area. But the way the epidemiologists work is until they've established that direct transmission chain. But pleasingly, all the remainder of the cases um, are linked. And do you, so have, do you have epi links for all these cases, like epidemiological links for all the new cases today, or is it just genomic uh, links? To the um, epidemiological links to all of the 8 p.m. cases. Um, and that's very pleasing sign, but what it means is, as we've, as I indicated um, in yesterday, one of the issues is because of a late recognition of a chain of transmission. By the time we've got to that, that train, that chain of transmission has um, unfurled, and we're then unpacking all of those cases, finding them, and then finding that they're household contacts by the time we've got to them. So that's why we were seeing a large number of new cases coming in through that had not been in isolation for their infectious period and at a number of growing exposure venues. We really hope that that will turn around um, and I'm hoping that by tomorrow we will gradually see that we're reporting cases and as I said because of the infectious nature of this we are expecting those household transmissions to have to continue Dr. to occur. Dr. And on the, regarding the Virgin flight just to be clear is it the one person that went to Great Ocean Foods the crew member and it was the one person then has flown on all those various flights? No no the um, one person who was at the the Great Ocean Foods outbreak obviously we we look at household contacts of people that worked there and this has been a, ha a household contact or a close contact of someone who works at Great Ocean Foods, that person unknowingly and so I, I just ask the media, this is not about blame, that person wouldn't have had symptoms and what's positive is that we're picking up that the flights are re relatively recent um, in, and um, obviously it's something we don't want to have occurred and one of the um, protections we've got in place is um, probably everyone has been aware that right throughout, even if any state had no restrictions, we still required people to be on flights wearing masks and the hostess, the, the flight crew and other flight crew 
were wearing masks. And the reason for that is we've been concerned about um, flights because of the rapid movement between states. And so those additional protections, and um, I've received advice from Virgin that they are very stringent with those requirements. So the, the, the task ahead of us is making sure we get the message to all of those individuals on those flights, work with our colleagues interstate and get testing and then we'll be able to assess where the transmission has arisen, but we've got those other layers of protection, which were the masks. Dr. Well. Chan, are our yeah. contact tracers now facing a backlog, given that a number of cases the last two days, they've been infectious in the community for some time? Uh, look, uh, the advice I've had is we've been actually getting to cases quite well, and, and um, I just want to applaud the um, role of the contact tracers. I think it's suffice to say they were a little relieved when um, they know that over the coming days they will have a reprieve um, in the sense that hopefully their workload will decline because they won't be having so many large venues. Um, the other place that I did just want to briefly um, indicate also to just call out specifically uh, was the Crossroads Hotel. Um, there was again another positive um, person who attended that um, linked to the Ocean Foods um, cluster and they attended an event at Crossroads on the 23rd of June and all people at the Crossroads between 7 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. are defined as close contact. So again, I want to acknowledge the support of the Crossroads Hotel. Um, QR codes are a great asset because we can really quite rapidly contact people. It may take a little time for us to then go back, but people have then been told to go into isolation and get tested and that's a very effective mechanism and hence our messaging to continue to do the QR codes. Dr. Jane, the nine-year-old child, 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 has the nine-year-old child been tested a second time and the parents as well? Um, so the nine-year-old child is a case, uh, definitely a case. Um, the family, uh, the contacts of the, um, have not yielded it. So we've tested students at the school, we've tested teachers, we've tested the family. And so there's no source for the nine-year-old. Um, as you know, the school is in, in close proximity, proximity to Bondi um, Junction and we just haven't found a, a link. Now, there is probably a missing link out there, but what we're hoping is that the high rates of testing around them will have um, detected any undetected chains of transmission. Is New South Wales Health in contact with that family? We're hearing that the child has to be 23 hours in, in isolation, can only have contact with their um, primary carer for 45 minutes in full PPE. Uh, look, I'm not going to comment on the specifics of cases. Um, if there is a positive case, the medical and clinical team provide advice about how we can prevent infection to others. And these are discussions that are best kept at that clinical um, level. Dr Chair, just in terms of the uh, limousine driver initially, have we figured out how he's caught the virus yet? Um, no, and, and I've got to say we may never do so. Um, I think I've explained before that um, we test international flight crew when they come in. Um, and as you know, that by the time they they leave, which is usually a very short turnaround time. So they usually just are meeting the um, aviation authority requirements for rest and then they depart. But we know that someone can be tested um, negative in the morning and that evening they can test positive. Um, so we are on a, we, we have reached out to the flight crew um, organisations, um, places like FedEx and others, and asked them whether any of their uh, flight crew t had tested positive. Um, we haven't, to my knowledge, received any advice back that any have. But again, um, one has to also understand that in Australia, we're very privileged to be in a setting of no community transmission, where we have actually incredible access to testing, whereas that does situation does not exist everywhere. And so our case ascertainment in Australia, where we you know, find cases, is going to be extremely high, but in other countries, you're not going to. And everybody, 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 Every um, member of the flight crew that got in this guy's car, every, one, every member of those flight crews were tested during the relevant period? Every member, every flight crew person that comes in gets a test at the airport before departing. And that happened 
in every case with every car I'm not being I'm car. not being aware that anyone had not been tested as I said it's the issue that at one, a test at one point in time um, and the flight crew leave at all hours of the day and night and usually in very ter tight turnarounds if we have a process that if anyone tests positive we work through and then um, identify close contacts and take the public health action I've got to say because of the tight turnarounds often they've already departed before we've um, got those results back. Premier, 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 what you were saying on contact traces, were you saying that our contact traces were overwhelmed before the lockdown was announced yesterday? No, I'm not saying they're overwhelmed. They weren't overwhelmed, but I think it, I was reflecting that um, knowing that you are working very, very hard and that the next day, next few days, and it won't be today and tomorrow, or the next day but hopefully later in the week that you'll have um, a lower workload because we won't be generating um, infectious people in the community and large exposure lists um, obviously brought some I believe happiness to them and I think that um, but at no time were they overwhelmed they've been working incredibly hard and as you know we work through multiple sources to get in contact with people um, we use the text messaging and I've got to say that's incredibly effective because people often wake up, you know, we send those out at 11.50 and people wake up to those messages in the phone in the morning. Um, and then we obviously follow it up with phone calls and um, we also use the media and have that call in system which has been added to our mechanism and again the community often, when, as soon as we do this at 11 o'clock, ring up and it self-identifies. So again, it really is a partnership with um, the community and um, I'm really grateful for the work of the close the contact tracing team and also the community in responding and keeping across and abreast the new venues. Premier, 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 Premier. Was that just been in the last 24 hours? Uh, so we have um, to 8pm last night there's one case in ICU obviously that changes and so we give out the data for that point in time. I believe that case is not uh, ventilated that's uh, a, a positive but obviously you know COVID is a serious condition and uh, we have had a number of cases which are elderly um, um, but it can also um, be a very severe illness for anyone so that's why we are taking this very seriously and ask everyone to follow the public health advice. Right, but, uh, can we ask you, uh, you know we're now there's about five million people in Greater Sydney now in lockdown did you delay the decision to call a lockdown because you wanted to keep your reputation as being the Premier who keeps open and, and looks after the economy? Uh, can I say very, very confidently and strongly that any success New South Wales has had to date is because our government has to the letter, to the letter followed the health advice. And as you saw yesterday, the health advice changed very quickly and uh, I made sure that as soon as uh, Dr Chan and the experts indicated concern that we got together our crisis cabinet and adopted in full the health advice. And that's what, something we've always done. We base our advice on the evidence, on the science presented to us from the health experts. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can actually ask the health experts themselves because every time they've provided advice to the government, we have adopted it because we have full confidence in them and they have confidence that we will do the right thing by our citizens. I'm not someone who will uh, be afraid to take any decision we need to to keep our residents safe, but also to make sure we provide as much information as possible. And to Dr Chan's point, can I just thank all of our contact tracers? They've done an unbelievable job. They've actually been able to stay a step ahead of the race, uh, a step ahead of the virus. But the challenge that was posed to us yesterday which Dr Champ presented is when you have an ongoing list of large venues with a large number of close potential close contacts that exacerbates the job they have to do but now that everybody is prevented from moving around prevented from going to those venues it just means their job is easier in getting on top of this and allowing us uh, hopefully after two weeks to be able to resume uh, some level of normal activity. Premier, are there are Premier, of, of other states who shut down and have you made a point of, of, of of saying that. Do you regret that now? No, I'm absolutely, I don't regret a single decision we've taken because all of it's been based on the health advice. And But also when you're making a major decision to lock down millions of people, millions and millions of people, you have to make sure it's based on the health advice. 
and not because you want to turn up with zero cases every day. We based all of our advice on balancing the health advice that we were given with making sure our citizens uh, were given that information. And so uh, these decisions are big decisions. Uh, it's not a decision you take lightly when you lock down literally millions and millions of people, but that's based on the health advice. And uh, I'm happy for any health expert to be asked any time of the day uh, whether or not the New South Wales government has followed their health advice. And I'm, I'm prepared to, if Dr Chan wants to answer that question at any stage, but uh, I wanna reassure the community. Um, I've never cared what people think about me. Uh, I, what I do care about is keeping people safe and not putting burdens on them unless we absolutely had to. Yesterday was a day where we had no other alternative, we had to. And uh, that's a decision we take to keep our community safe, but also uh, during the course of the next few days and weeks, make sure we keep everybody and provide as much information as possible to provide as much certainty as possible. We know when people are thinking about jobs, thinking about work, thinking about their own personal circumstances, they want as much certainty as possible. And that's what we intend to provide. Yeah, months ago, health experts, months ago, health experts were raised. Sorry, I'll go here and then here. Yep. Osgrid has announced power outages this week, particularly in the east. East, would you encourage them to delay any work while people are stuck at home? Look, I'm not aware of that, but obviously we just ask people uh, to be considerate of the fact that most of us will be spending most of the time uh, in homes or in residences as opposed to anywhere else. And we just ask all organisations to take that into account. Obviously during this time, freight and logistics becomes particularly important. And to reiterate Deputy Commissioner Warboys's uh, comments earlier, please don't uh, panic by. There is every opportunity uh, to make sure that you you can buy anything when you need it. We ask people to be responsible, but when you are out and about buying necessary items, please wear a mask, please hand sanitise, please keep social distancing. Mask wearing is only one of a number of things we need to do to keep each other safe. And what we really need to appreciate, and Dr Chan's update on all the venues highlighted this, is every time we step out of the home, we have to act as though we have the virus or those that we come into any physical proximity with have the virus. And that's really important. We don't know necessarily if we're a close contact until health notifies us. We don't want to know that unintentionally we've given the virus to others or unintentionally infected or subjected others to isolation. So it's really important when you leave the home to act in a way that you have the virus or that anybody you come into close proximity with has the virus. So for example, we've said it's okay to exercise with up to groups of 10 outdoors without a mask. We want to encourage that because uh, it's the only opportunity people have to safely be outside their homes without a mask, uh, interacting with others. But whilst you're doing that, please maintain your social distancing. We don't want anybody in that group of 10 to unintentionally spread the virus to the other nine people. So just be extra cautious. Know that every time you leave the home, you could have the virus, somebody you're in physical proximity with could, and just be extra careful because the last thing we want to do is infect those that are closest to us. Do we need to rethink the vaccine rollout in particular on eligibility? We've got people in their 20s and their 30s who are feeling pretty crook. I mean, Adam Marshall said he felt like he was hit by a bus. These people can't get a dose of the vaccine yet. Will you move that eligibility to 30 to 39 year olds now? Well, the challenge is we have literally millions of people in New South Wales that want to get the vaccine. Uh, we can't control the state government, the New South Wales government can't control how many doses we get. But what I want to assure the community is uh, whenever we're provided with those doses, we're getting them in arms. And can I make this point? I was really pleased that in the last few days, we got through the 2 million jabs uh, milestone in New South Wales. Can I please encourage those of you who've had your first AstraZeneca, please go back to get the second one. Don't hesitate. I've had both my shots. If the first one hasn't affected you adversely, the second one won't. That's the best advice from the health experts. And can I also encourage those of you who are eligible for the vaccines to go to your GP or to the New South Wales uh, health hubs. Pleasingly, our hubs in New South Wales are exceeding about 100,000 jabs a week, which is a great outcome. And we hope to see that number hold up or even increase in the next few weeks. So, the third state of origin will be moved out of Sydney? Well, look, those conversations are happening, and that I, I would assume would depend on how the situation looks in the next little while. In to the health the health in for additional the health vaccines oh, during look, this time? Whether we're in an outbreak or a lockdown or otherwise, the New South Wales government has always said, give us more vaccines. Uh, that has always been our position. I think you can see on the record, I've always demonstrated our sense of urgency. What this outbreak in New South Wales has demonstrated is that no matter how good your systems are, 
uh, no matter what situation you're in, it's not until the vast majority of our population is vaccinated that we will be able to protect our citizens. That's the bottom line. In a pandemic, we don't know what variants will emerge in the future. We don't know how transmissible those future variants will be. But what we do know is that early indications are certainly in New South Wales and across Australia that those who've been vaccinated do have that added layer of protection. We are seeing instances, and Dr Champ, perhaps in the next week or so, we'll be able to give some further comment on the fact that those who've been vaccinated have demonstrated quite good resistance to this variant as opposed to those that haven't. And that is that is basic science. And so obviously the more of our population vaccinated uh, is the only way in which we can be assured that our citizens will be safe and have a COVID normal existence until this uh, pandemic is over. Yeah, on that point, vaccine, yeah. What percentage of vaccinations in New South Wales would you be happy with to avoid a lockdown? Yeah, well, look, um, I said some weeks ago, I went out on a limb and said, once we have 10 million jabs in New South Wales, which would be about 80% of our adult population, we can start having those conversations. Uh, that I've, I said that quite a number of weeks ago. We're at 2 million jabs. Once we get to 10 million jabs, we can start having those conversations about what COVID normal looks like. But also we have to remember uh, under those circumstances that if you're not vaccinated and the vast majority of the population is vaccinated and moving around freely, uh, that you will be obviously uh, in danger of getting the virus and being subjected to its consequences. So we know there's great demand in New South Wales. What we need is those doses. And clearly we've been advised that you know, in the next few months, those doses will increase and that's welcome news. What I do know is through the surveys that customer service has done through the millions of people on our app, that there is a high demand for the vaccine. People are keen to get vaccinated in New South Wales and we're keen to provide that as soon as those doses are made available. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, is, is two weeks long enough? Is two weeks, a uh, two week lockdown long enough? The Avalon cluster, I think had 30 cases at, at its height, took, took weeks to get under control. Is two weeks enough? Well, look, that's the best health advice we have, but I will ask Dr Chant to comment on that. When she gave us her advice yesterday, she recommended two weeks, which is the advice we accepted, um, and I'll ask her to comment further. So obviously we want sufficient time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, we obviously wanted sufficient time to bring this outbreak under control, and two weeks we deemed as necessary. Um, shorter outbreaks really just are about catching up, whereas we really want to get to know community transmission as soon as possible, basically extinguish it. The situation in the Northern Beaches cluster was interesting because we actually had two outbreaks occurring at the same time. So we had a Barala cluster associated with the, um, a transport driver who was infected occurring at the same time as the cluster in the Avalon cluster. And at that time, um, we were fighting two different clusters and therefore it grumbled, grumbled along. What's interesting with this case is I was reflecting with the team. If we go back on our website, for those that are interested, we've got the epidemiological reports that are done weekly. And if you go back there, you'll look at the number of uh, unlinked cases that we had each week. And if you go back to that period, both with the Crossroads and also the subsequent Avalon and um, Barella clusters, you'll see that, that during those periods, there were actually quite a lot of unlinked cases. So what's been fascinating at the moment is despite the high rates of testing, the cases of in general, except with a couple of exceptions, have been really clearly linked once we found that missing case. So that missing case was the key to the puzzle, but what that missing case did was identify this whole chain of transmission, which is what we've got to mop up at this moment. Now, obviously we have to be very cautious and um, look at the data every day, but that was why I'd indicated that if we all take this very seriously, we maintain those testing numbers, then two weeks may be sufficient for us to have that comfort. But what I'd be liking to do is in that final week, basically for a very significant period of time, having all of our cases being totally in isolation and only occurring in, in, in close contacts of those people that are in already isolation and having those close contacts in isolation. Minister Hazard, I can't ask you a question uh, you haven't answered. You go, sorry, just the, the ICU case, can you give the age and had that person been vaccinated? Um, yes, we can. We don't usually give out personal health information, which vaccination status is. We do report in our 
uh, report. Um, perhaps we'll collate some of the information on the status of um, vaccination status. So let me just um, think about how to best give that. Minister Hazard, Minister Hazard, um, on Friday, whistleblowers <coughs> involved in transporting returned travellers into hotel quarantine raised concerns about the protocols followed by a private drivers transporting air crew from the airport to their hotel quarantine. Since then, on Friday night, you changed the rules to make it tougher for uh, private drivers to wear masks, be vaccinated, etc. But we now know that police don't have enough evidence to charge this limousine driver or his company under the health orders because I don't know if he breached those health orders. Is changing the rules on Friday an acknowledgement of a policy failure on your behalf when you changed the rules in December? Um, all the way through this uh, pandemic, this one in 100, one in 100 year pandemic, uh, there have been an evolution of circumstances. Um, but the drivers and workers who were picking up uh, uh, people from the airport had very clear uh, guidelines that were expressed by the police to them through their management of that situation. Uh, it's disappointing that apparently uh, a small number didn't comply. Uh, there have actually been a vaccine hub um, and swabbing uh, available at the airport for many, many months. Um, I'm absolutely dumbfounded, to be honest, how anybody who is bringing somebody in from an international flight could think that it's okay not to comply in every possible way. Uh, hang on, James, I'll finish, thank you. And as I said now, three times in three days, you weren't here for any of those. You can't legislate for stupidity. Um, but we have now put in very hard uh, black and white law that uh, for even those who don't want to comply with the common sense guidelines and the guidelines that were laid down in black and white by the police, it's there now and it carries sanctions. But Minister, if the initial guidelines were sufficient, Sorry, if the initial James, guidelines were sufficient and moment. clear enough. Sorry, James, what? If the initial guidelines were sufficient and clear enough, why did you need to change the health James, I've just Friday? answered that, and seriously, you need to get on with the real game. Yes, sorry. Just to, just to clarify, um, under the letter of the law in the public <coughs> health order, as it stood before Friday, this mm. driver didn't need to wear a mask. Is that correct? What is clear is that the clinical guidelines, oh, sorry, the guidelines so, sorry, that were laid... The, the public health order, <coughs> well, actual law, not the guidelines. But the stuff. guidelines were laid down as part of the conditions, OHS requirements, uh, by the police. The police understood they were complying, we understood they were complying, um, but as an abundant caution, there are now those uh, orders in place. But, the but was that an, an oversight by the New South Wales government, though, that it wasn't in the public health order initially? Was that an oversight by the New South Wales government? No. It, look, as, as the Premier and I and Dr Chant have said, for the last 16 months, there is an evolution of circumstances I mean, you guys can all be instant experts, but you're journalists, you're not epidemiologists. We take our advice from the health authorities and the advice that we were following was exactly what we were required to do. And of course, the issue then is that, uh, unfortunately, as I said, you can't regulate for stupidity. Are you expecting a bump in the number of vaccines administered like we saw in Victoria? And do you have the supply to maintain that? Oh, sorry, this is the last question. Um, in relation to vaccines, certainly when um, I asked this morning, we haven't seen anyone uh, d d diminish demand. In fact, in our New South Wales hubs, we did it the most we've ever done, over 100,000 jabs. I expect that to continue. Please come forward to get your vaccine. Don't let that be a reason uh, uh, not to leave your home and get, get the medical attention you need. But I know that the more doses we have, the more people will get the vaccine. But I do want to encourage those of you who are up for your second jab of AstraZeneca, please don't hesitate to get that. And of course, for those of you over 60, please make sure you get the AstraZeneca because that's the best health advice. Thank, Thank you. you. you yeah. 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 Sorry, Sorry, that, Sorry that was the last question. Sorry, that was the last question. Sorry, do you have the supply though to meet that projected demand? If it's increasing, do you have the supply Look, to meet uh, that projected Look, as demand? I've said on many occasions, uh, the more doses we have, the more jabs we'll be able to get into arms. And the GPs themselves want to do more. More GPs want to come online. And uh, as you know, I've had those conversations with the federal government to get more G GPs want to do more, and they should. Uh, because when all the GPs do more, when the New South Wales health hubs are active, as well as in future pharmacies, which we'll have uh, something to say about um, in the next few days, um, that will mean that we have you know, increased capacity to get those jabs in arms. What we don't have is more supply, but we're looking forward to that increasing in coming weeks as we've been advised. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.